recording. So yeah, I was like, oh, I know the perfect guy. Um, so yeah, I, I miss you. <laughs> yeah, well, I miss you. I miss having students like you as well. Yes, so thank you. Uh, you know, hard to come by sometimes, so. Yeah, how is uh, Mankato? Well, you know how a Mankato is. It's never very slow to change. Let's put it that way. So okay. uh, not a lot going on. You know, COVID's uh, definitely changed things, but mm -hmm. uh, Mankato is still Mankato. When was the last time you were back? I would say th two years ago. Okay. Um, and actually revisiting was like, whoa, I feel like I want to go back to school again. So I was working at um, like a mushroom market in right. the Twin Cities area. And then it's like, whoa, yeah, I miss the lab life and I kind of want to go back to school. So now I work at Mayo Clinic here in Rochester. So I've been right doing that for over a year now and I'm trying to um, transfer to Arizona and get my master's there and hopefully work at Mayo there with doing some research or something. Right on. Which, yeah. uh, which Arizona school, ASU, Arizona State? Uh, uh, Tempe. Yeah, Arizona State, that's where I went. Yeah, yeah they have uh, yeah. like plant biology with conservation or something. And yeah. I, ever since I took your class, plant physiology is just like definitely my area that I'm interested in. And that's why I started this podcast because I couldn't find any other podcasts that kind of talk about plant physiology or um, fungal ecology. Sure. So, yeah, well, Arizona State, Tempe, uh, that's a good place to do plant uh, ecophysiology and okay. uh, conservation. So, that's, uh, yeah, you'll love it. You'll okay. Love it. I'm that. excited. So, yeah. hopefully, this fall I can transfer there and start school whenever I can. So, yeah, the first month will be uh, rough with uh, adjusting to the heat. I remember, God, the first month I lived uh, in Tempe, I had to walk around with a gallon of water with me. Um, oh but God. you quickly, I mean, you really do quickly, you know, get used to it. You adjust. Right, uh, right. acclimate really fast. That's good. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's not a not a bad place to be, especially on a day like today. Yeah, uh, no, I'm I'm planning to visit um, halfway through April and kind of check out some some stuff if... I can do that. So right on. very cool. So yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, I guess tell um, listeners a little bit about who you are and uh, what got you into plant physiology. <laughs> a little in a little intro. All right. Well, my name is uh, Chris Rowland. I am a professor of biological sciences here at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Uh, I've been here for, this is my 20th year, believe it or not, at uh, MSU. Uh, I came here directly from Arizona State, uh, where I got my PhD in plant ecophysiology, uh, working in uh, the lab of uh, Dr. Thomas Day at Arizona State. Um, my thesis, or my dissertation research was actually on uh, climate change and how climate change uh, specifically ultraviolet radiation associated with ozone depletion and uh, increases in regional temperatures on the Antarctic Peninsula are affecting vascular plants um, in that area. So spent quite a bit of time in Antarctica studying uh, climate change and uh, effects on plants. Uh, came here, uh, continued that research um, prior to being at ASU. Uh, I grew up actually in West Virginia, uh, strangely enough. Oh. Um, Interesting. I got my undergraduate degree at a small school uh, named uh, Wheeling Jesuit College. And now I think it's Wheeling University. Um, and then I got my master's at West Virginia University. Um, and kind of, I just, you know, growing up in West Virginia, I grew up in a very small rural uh, part of West Virginia outside of Wheeling in the Northern Panhandle. And I literally, you know, had the forest 10 yards from the back door of my house. So awesome. I spent a lot of time in the woods, uh, in the forest, running around. And actually, uh, when I went to school, I wasn't really interested in ecology or by uh, ecology or plants at all. Um, my I come from a family of uh, mainly medicine. Uh, a lot of my, my grandfather was a cardiologist. I have a lot mm. of aunts and, uh, that are nurses and things of that nature. <laughs> a lot of cousins that are doctors and things like that. So I, I you know, 
a lot of I think a lot of people, you know, when they go to to college and they're interested in in biology, you know, want to go into medicine for one reason or another. Yeah. And uh, when I started at Wheeling uh, Jesuit, uh, you know, I planned on actually strangely enough wanted to be a dermatologist. Um, I, I have no idea where that came from, but um, you know, I took my first ecology class as a sophomore, and uh, you know, I remember. I remember the moment, you know, I was, it was the middle of November and I was uh, in a stream uh, holding nets, you know, up until, you know, water levels were like this high on me, a pair of waders and, you know, just sitting there laughing and having the greatest time ever. And um, I looked at the professor and I said, this is great. Can I like, can I get a job doing this type of stuff? He looked at me and said, well, of course you can. And it was something I never knew, you know, I didn't know you could get a job, you know, doing this type of stuff. Um, And so, you know, I spent a lot of time as a, as a kid running around the woods and flipping over rocks, looking for salamanders and, and crayfish and things like that. And so uh, I got really interested in stream ecology actually starting out. And uh, at the school I was at Wheeling Jesuit, we had to do an undergraduate research project. That was actually a requirement uh, to graduate. And this is back in the Mm. eighties. and that was something that, you know, not a lot of college kids at that time were involved with doing undergraduate research. And so I, you know, picked an advisor. Uh, luckily, the guy um, that I went up, ended up working for was he was a brand new faculty member, uh, young, very energetic. And, uh, you know, he said, yeah, you come, you know, work for me. So, uh, you know, I designed a project actually str- uh, looking at caddisflies. I don't know if you know what caddisflies are. Mm-mm. Caddisfly larvae, um, they're coleopterans, they're beetles, but the, the larvae are aquatic. Okay. And um, they hatch and they live uh, through their larval stages in freshwater streams. And one of the things that they do in their larval stage is they build a case uh, to house themselves in. It's like a little house for the, the larvae. Oh, interesting. And they pick, I was interested in trying to figure out how these larvae pick materials to build their house out of. And the early instar larvae um, pick uh, leaf material. And the, the, the specific genus I was looking at picked leaf material uh, to build their little houses out of. And uh, I designed some experiments where we gave the larvae, you know, stripped the larvae out of their homes mm-hmm. and put them into uh, individual chambers and uh, gave them different types of leaves. Mm-hmm. And uh, got really interested in trying to figure out, okay, why, you know, why does the larvae pick, you know, sumac over, say, a uh, oak leaf or a beech leaf or a maple leaf or whatever. And it come to find out that it's all based upon leaf rigidity. And um, I mean, I know you know, uh, you know, a lot of leaf rigidity is based upon lignin concentration and and what makes up the cell wall and things like that. And so (laughs) that kind of what got me started, started my interest in plants. Oh, wow. That's Um, really interesting. Yeah. And when I went to grad school, you know, I could have went two ways. Um, I could have went into stream ecology or I could have went into plants and I just kind of fell into the plant world. Hmm. And here I am. I like that. Wow. uh, Funny how things work. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. I didn't even know. Um, Yeah, that's so connected with leaves and stuff. That's really interesting. yeah, so I guess that um, tying that into like photosynthesis, um, the structure and kind of what is photosynthesis and like why is it important for um, plants or just in general for humans as well? Yeah, so, you know, photosynthesis is arguably, or maybe not arguably, one of the most, if not the most important set of, you know, reactions on this planet, at least I think so, and I think it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So it forms the foundation for the flow of energy through, you know, most of, uh, you know, the biosphere. Um, You know, if you're not uh, in some deep cave system or something like that, uh, you know, nine times, nine 0.9 0.9 times out of 10, you know, you're talking about a system that relies upon photosynthesis for the input of energy. And that's where I kind of, you know, got interested in how leaves harvest light, uh, what happens to that energy, where does it go, uh, in what forms is it stored. Um, and that's what kind of got me interested. And, and, you know, my first, this is 
at MSU, this is the only teaching gig I've had other than being a grad student. And I, you took plant physiology from me. And of mm -hmm. course, you took general botany from me. And you know that photosynthesis is a very important part of both of those classes. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just, you know, shaped some of my interests and my love for photosynthesis. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware, you know, I've been teaching students now for 20 years. Uh, you know, as soon as you start mentioning photosynthesis, a lot, of, I'm saying, not saying all, and it certainly wasn't you, right? But a lot of students, as soon as you start talking about photosynthesis, you know, they do the, oh God, yeah. here we go. Eyes glazed. Because, you know, they had to sit through three lectures on aerobic respiration, right? And mm -hmm. as a, in high school and yeah. in uh, your 100 level biology class, first semester, you got to sit through, you know, the Krebs cycle yep. and all that uh, citric acid and all that stuff. And, uh, and then, oh, and then maybe you have one lecture devoted to photosynthesis. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, it's basically just respiration in reverse. Well, that's not true <laughs> at all. All right. Um, when you know, as well as I do, you know, a lot of students, when they start in biology, if they don't want to go into medicine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of them want to work with animals. Well, yep. I want to be a, I want to be a marine biologist, mm -hmm. or I want to be, yeah. you know, go collar wolves in Yellowstone, that type of thing. And uh, those jobs are out there. Don't get me wrong, uh, but they're incredibly difficult to land. And when uh, when they do become available, the competition for those jobs is incredibly high. Um, but you know, we're always going to need plants, mm -hmm. and there are. I mean, I was reading a thing not too long ago about, you know, how there's a demand for students uh, in plant science. Um, you know, I've had plenty of students, you know, come through these doors and leave, leave with a job, you know, before they even have their diploma in hand, because there's that much of a demand, yeah. you know, especially in the ag and biotech yes, yeah. um, right now. It's That's just also huge. another awesome class, the yeah. plant biotechnology. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, photosynthesis is so incredibly important to, I mean, for those of us that breathe oxygen, you know, it's, it's kind of important, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> I don't need uh, it. You know, so uh, I try to emphasize the importance of photosynthesis and I make it interesting, mm -hmm. you know, and, and start off with explaining, you know, why it's so incredibly important and, you know, the flow of energy through the biosphere and you know, how much energy is lost every time, you know, you make a step up the trophic ladder and things like that. And that's kind of the approach, you know, we start with in general botany. And then um, in physiology, you know, we dive head first, you know, with the capture of light and uh, the transfer of light uh, through the, diff you know, the transfer of light through the, and the energy associated with those incoming photons, you know, through the light harvesting complex, then take it from there, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've done this, you know, that, you know, we start off with light and uh, the capture of light, and we end with the production of carbohydrates and literally cover every single thing in between, or at least I try to. Mm -hmm. But you make it interesting. Um, and Yeah. I liked it. So uh, maybe start with um, describing like the different parts that are interacted or intersected with it, like the chlorophyll or mm -hmm. um, yeah, the parts. Sure. Oh, you know, I and you know me, I could spend hours and hours. <laughs> I could spend an entire semester on this, <laughs> uh, but we'll try to make it brief. Um, so you know, not going through the evolution of chlorophyll or anything like that, but we know that there are uh, specific pigments associated with photosynthesis. Now let's just talk about oxygenic photosynthesis in higher plants um, and, out, and, and some algae and cyanobacteria. Some of the cyanobacteria would fall into this category as well. But, uh, you know, we're talking about chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B uh, mainly, and the carotenoids. Um, and they are housed um, in a light harvesting complex. You know, and the light harvesting complex is a, you know, a complex of proteins and pigments um, in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. So uh, I heard you in, I think it was your uh, podcast number one, talk about the endosymbiotic theory you had mentioned. 
Um, and we know that, or I should say, you know, that the, the whole endosymbiotic theory is that chloroplasts derive from prokaryotic progenitors. And of course, through, a, through an endosymbiotic event, you know, they uh, became associated with uh, eukaryotic cells and, uh, you know, they were retained. We know that chloroplasts contain their own DNA. Um, they're surrounded by a double membrane. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that they, you know, derive from prokaryotes. Um, but inside of the chloroplast, of course, we have uh, a set of internal membranes called thylakoids. And in these thylakoids uh, are a series of um, complexes that are involved in electron transfer. So uh, we've got uh, the major complexes associated with photosynthesis, of course, are photosystems one and two. Uh, photosystem one and two each have their own separate light harvesting complex. Um, we also have a uh, multi-subunit uh, complex called cytochrome B6F and uh, also a NADP reductase enzyme. These are all housed in the thylakoid membranes. And then to finish things up, I'm going to mute my computer here so I don't keep having those pop up. Uh, also in the thylakoid membranes, you know, we have a ATPase uh, enzyme as well involved in the production of ATP. So it starts off with your, um, you know, if you draw out the chemical formula for photosynthesis, you know, and you've all done this, if you're watching this podcast, you've done this, you know, right, CO2 and H2O, and then the arrow with light mm -hmm. and chlorophyll and enzymes yields uh, CH2O, CH2ON, carbohydrates, mm -hmm. uh, plus water, uh, plus oxygen, right? Um, but you have to realize that's the net reaction, all right? There's a series of, oh God, 50, 60 or so uh, reactions that make up photosynthesis, all right? And that's just the overall net reaction. So uh, the reactants, of course, are carbon dioxide and water. Well, plants, of course, get carbon dioxide uh, from the air and water from the soil most of the time. Um, and uh, the light energy that you draw over top of the arrow is obviously probably, uh, you know, the most important part in this in that it's the energy from the sun that's providing the uh, input of energy into the system to drive this reaction. So in the thylakoid membranes, think of it, we got a photon, you know, photons of light leaving the sun, right? And uh, eight minutes later, they're, you know, hitting the out, outer edge of our atmosphere. Well, if they don't bounce back out into space or if they don't get bounced around by clouds, Rayleigh scattering or aerosols or anything like that, eventually they, you know, make their way down to the leaf. Well, these photons, you know, come screaming into the leaf, you know, they pass through the cuticle, they pass through the epidermis. And we could talk about how the epidermal cells are shaped to kind of focus light down into the mesophyll where the photosynthesis is occurring. But eventually they make their way down to um, the cells that house the chloroplast. And uh, in the chloroplast, as I said, we've got these uh, uh, protein, com protein enzyme complexes uh, in the thylakoids. And eventually, you know, a photon comes down and it hits a photosystem. Well, uh, these photosystems were actually named in order of discovery, not necessarily where they fit in the uh, electron transport chain. Well, that energy, uh, that photon that comes down, you know, based upon its wavelength has a very specific energy associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. And the amount of energy contained in that photon has to ex exactly equal the amount of energy needed to raise one of these chlorophyll molecules up to excited permitted state. All right, so if that energy, and again, what is chlorophyll, you know, what, what wavelengths does, does chlorophyll most strongly absorb? Well, it's your blues and your reds. So uh, if one of these photons, you know, come down and have the exact amount of energy necessary to be absorbed, well, that electron goes shooting up into an excited permitted state. Well, that electron falls back down and in the process of falling back down, it can pass that energy off to a neighboring chlorophyll molecule. So these light harvesting complexes, and, and you've heard me tell this story before, I kind of like to think of them as, as funnels. Mm -hmm. All right. And when that energy is captured, it funnels through those antenna pigments, all those chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoid uh, pigments 
that are, you know, uh, attached to proteins in the thylakoid membrane until it reaches uh, the reaction center chlorophyll. And those chlorophylls, we call them chlorophyll ASPs, uh, they're special, SP meaning special. Um, they have the ability, all right, to take that energy that has been transferred to them uh, and do something with it. So what winds up happening is that energy is absorbed, uh, that reaction center chlorophyll becomes excited. And that electron or that uh, reaction center chlorophyll can then start the electron transport process. All right, and it all starts off in photosystem too. Now here's the great thing about this, all right. Um, as that reaction center chlorophyll in photosystem two uh, becomes exciting, gets ready to pass off its electron, well, it wants its electron back, all right? And where does it get that electron from? Water, all right? So associated with photosystem two, we have what's called the oxygen evolving complex. The oxygen evolving complex sits on the lumen side of the thylakoid membranes. And the job of the oxygen evolving complex is to split water. And as water is split, um, that's a process called photolysis. Electrons are donated to photosystem two to your reaction center chlorophylls. We call that one P680. Um, and in the process, protons are released in the lumen space. All right. And oxygen is given off as a byproduct. All right. That oxygen that you're breathing right now, the oxygen that I'm breathing right now, all right, is the product of you know, billions of years of photosynthesis. So oxygen is one of the products, one of the byproducts of photosynthesis. Um, but, you know, that's not what photosynthesis is about, is not you know, to produce oxygen. It's, it's to generate energy, chemical energy. All right. So we're transferring, transforming solar energy over into chemical energy through this process of capturing this energy and then shuffling this energy to create ATP and NADPH. So after photosystem two, you know, gets this electron, it shuffles it to an acceptor molecule and I won't bore you all with that, but it goes through a series of uh, different uh, molecules, pheophyton, quinone A, quinone B, cytochrome B6F, um, when cytochrome B6F, so cytochrome B6F sits between your two photosystems. When it, when electrons pass through cytochrome B6F, it, you know, moves protons from the stroma down into the lumen, you know, creating this huge proton gradient. And eventually the electrons make their way over to photosystem one and photosystem one. And, you know, every time you pass these electrons, you're losing energy um, because one thing Newton's taught us is, you know, no process is 100% efficient. So you're losing energy. You got to add a little more energy in the form of light. So again, the whole transfer of energy through resonance energy transfer down to the reaction center chlorophyll photosystem one. And uh, the reaction center chlorophyll is called P700 and it gets raised up to an excited state as well. Then passes the energy to another complex called NADP reductase. And that energy is that electron is then used to reduce NADP to NADPH, which is also chemical energy. Well, these protons that have accumulated in the lumen of the thylakoids then, all right, uh, for anybody who's had, you know, basic biology, you know, uh, a process called osmosis. Well, chemiosmosis, these protons move from areas of high concentration in the lumen to areas of low concentration outside of the thylakoids, the stroma. And in the process, they move through the last complex called ATPase. And ATPase um, is, oh, it's, it's very cool. Um, you know, it's got, uh, it spins like a top. The, the subunits that sit in the thylakoid membranes spin and move protons through them. And as it spins, it provides mechanical energy to phosphorylate ADP over into ATP. Now, everybody who's watching your podcast should know ATP is chemical energy. Mm -hmm. So the whole function of a the first set of reactions in photosynthesis, we call these the light dependent reactions because 
They depend on light. All right. Um, the whole function of the light dependent reactions is to generate ATP and NADPH. Oh, and it just so happens that, the, you know, produces oxygen yeah. as well, okay. which is kind of important for, you know, those of us who breathe it, right? <laughs> okay. um, so this ATP and this NADPH um, is chemical energy. We've converted solar energy, energy from the sun, and used it to generate chemical energy, something that the plant can use. So I don't, do you want yeah. to do you want me to go on and talk yeah, about the light independent yeah yeah or? definitely okay um so the production of atp and nadph occur on the stromal side all right and this chemical energy atp and nadph is then used all right for the next next set of reactions which we call the light independent reactions of which the calvin cycle I'm sure some of you remember that from high school, is a big part. But the long and short of it is, and let's just keep it simple here and talk about C3 photosynthesis, is you are taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. All right, and what is, you know, what is the current CO2 concentration? Well, I looked the other day, <laughs> looks like it's about 415 parts per million. Oh, wow. All right, definitely... and uh, we're taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, all right, and we are attaching it to a five carbon compound called RUBP. RUBP stands for ribulose 15 bisphosphate. Yes. So you take a five carbon RUBP and a one carbon CO2 and put them together. So, KK, do you remember what the name of the enzyme is that does Rubisco. that? Visco. <laughs> four, four years. Uh, uh, poor KK. Caitlin had me for, for different classes throughout her, her matriculation at MSU. Uh, Rubisco. All right. So, Rubisco uh, is an incredibly important enzyme. Rubisco um, is, that's an acronym, actually. The acronym stands for ribulose 15 bisphosphate carboxylase slash oxygenase. And um, what it does, oh, I got a chat here. What it does is that it, oh, you're not mic'd, okay. Uh, what it does is it takes that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and attaches it to the five carbon RUBP, all right? Um, and it immediately generates a six carbon compound, um, a keto arabinitol uh, molecule. It's got a big long name I won't bore you with, um, but that, molecule is incredibly unstable and it and breaks down into two three carbon molecules hence the name c3 photosynthesis and those three carbon molecules right so five plus one is equal to two times three all right mm -hmm. and those three carbon molecules then uh go through a series of reductions and so we got fixation we've got reduction and it's reduced using atp and nadph um, and to create a compound called phosphoglycerate then phosphoglycerate gets further reduced uh, to make g3p glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and this is a triose phosphate that can be then be used to create sugars all right or carbohydrates now it's a cycle all right, the Calvin cycle is circular. So this cycle, all right, needs to regenerate itself. We need to regenerate that five carbon RUBP. So basically what happens is um, for every three turns of the Calvin cycle. So every time you bring in a, for every time you bring in a CO2, all right, uh, you are gonna generate, if you do this three times, you're going to generate six G3Ps, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, and each one of those has three carbons, all right? Um, of those six, one drops out, leaving five that's going to stay in the cycle. Mm -hmm. And through a process uh, affectionately known as the sugar shuffle, all right, um, <laughs> And KK smiling because she knows if I was lecturing right now, I'd do a little dance, the sugar shuffle. Uh, you regenerate those five triose phosphates, regenerate three RUBPs. So the cycle starts anew. So basically, you need to run this cycle six times to generate one 
glucose molecule or one hexo sugar. Wow, right? that's so inefficient. So you're going to need to bring in, and that makes sense, right? So if you want to net a dime, then I have to hand you 10 pennies, all right? And it's the same idea with making a sugar, all right? So if we're talking about like, a, like glucose, all right, glucose has six carbons. Well, if you want to make a six carbon sugar, you need to bring in six molecules of carbon dioxide. The cycle spins, all right? And two of those G3Ps then fall out to make carbohydrate. So that, in a nutshell, all right, what do you do with that sugar? Well, there's a lot of things you can do, all right? You can use it to drive metabolism. You can be, you know, shuffled over into aerobic respiration that we all know and love, right? I'm being very sarcastic with that, all right? I like <laughs> photosynthesis respiration, but... Um, <laughs> It can be used for storage. You know, you can store it. You can make it into fructose, you know, uh, or and uh, attach that to a glucose and make sucrose and move it to somewhere else inside of the plant. Or you can store it in the form of starch, which is a long chain uh, polysaccharide that's just made up of repeating glucose monomers, um, which can be cut, you know, and saved for later. So there's all kinds of different things you can do with those triose phosphates that fall out. Um, and the big thing about it is it all starts with Rubisco, our good friend Rubisco. Oh, yeah, Rubisco. Big, bad, beautiful Rubisco. Um, and you've heard me say this before, right? Um, Rubisco is a very large, very large enzyme. Um, and it's a very beautiful enzyme. If you ever get the chance, look at it on, uh, you know, get a rotating uh, image of Rubisco and look at, you know, I think it's got like 16 different subunits. And, yeah, I'll try to link um, it in my show notes. Molecule. Um, but the problem is Rubisco is very slow. All right. Um, it's not that great at its job. It, uh, I think if memory serves me correctly, I think you can process about three molecules of carbon dioxide per second, uh, which is fairly slow for an enzyme. Hmm. And the other issue with Rubisco is it's not it doesn't do a very good job. Uh, if you're in my class, you hear me say it's a dumb enzyme. Well, it's <laughs> a dumb enzyme. But it also uh, acts on oxygen. All right. So what is the acronym? Ribulose 15 bisphosphate carboxylase slash oxygenase. Mm -hmm. Now we want Rubisco to act like a carboxylase to bring in carbon dioxide. And we know enzymes are named after what they do. Mm -hmm. So ribulose 15 bisphosphate carboxylase carboxylates, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, R-U-B-P. That's what we want, or that's what a plant wants. All right. And I'm sure you do this too, KK. You tend to anthropomorphize plants. You make them sound like <laughs> they want things, right? Yeah. Yep. We, all do. Yep. Um, we know plants, of course, don't want things and so on. But anyway, um, the problem is when Rubisco acts like an oxygenase. All right. And there's a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide. And when Rubisco acts as an oxygenase, then it creates problems for C3 plants because instead of act attaching a carbon, it attaches an oxygen to RUBP. And five carbons in RUBP and zero carbons in oxygen means, all right, we've got a problem. And instead of creating two three-carbon molecules, it creates one three-carbon molecule and one two-carbon molecule. And it's that two carbon molecule that's a problem, all right? That two carbon molecule has to be reclaimed. And that's a process we call photorespiration and it requires more energy from the plant. It's a wasteful process. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell, KK. I love it. Uh, what, can you tell me like what the difference of C3 and C4 uh, really is again? Sure. So C3 plants is the process we just described. C3 mm -hmm. plants have issues with photorespiration. Uh, C4 plants are plants that have, um, through the process of evolution, uh, evolved a mechanism to cope with this issue of photorespiration by uh, creating a spatial separation between where carbon is brought in and where carbon is actually uh, fixed by Rubisco, um, and it utilizes a, uh, a different enzyme for the initial um, process uh, called PEPC. So PEPC stands for phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxylase, mm -hmm. and PEPC 
uh, is going to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and attach it to a three carbon molecule called phosphoenolpyruvate, EP, to make a four carbon molecule called uh, malate or aspartate, depending upon the species. Hmm. Um, and the good thing about C4 plants is that Pepsi has absolutely no affinity for oxygen. Hmm. And you've heard me say before that, um, you know, just like in the 1980s, the uh, cola, Pepsi Cola, you know, came out and their big advertising slogan was the choice of a new generation. Well, Pepsi, uh, the enzyme is the choice of a new generation of plants, C4 hmm. plants, right? That evolved yeah. in response to this issue surrounding uh, photorespiration and reductions in uh, global CO2 concentrations and increases in aridity and things like that. Mm -hmm. So what are some examples of each? Uh, oh, well, you know, C4 plants uh, are typically, you know, very uh, well represented in the grass, grasses, the poaceae. Uh, so things like big blue stem, corn, corn yep. is a C4 plant, right? Sorghum is another one, you know, uh, there's a reason you know, why we can, we do so well at growing corn is because they exhibit C4 photosynthesis, right? They have mm -hmm. some uh, mechanisms in place to deal with uh, water use and water availability and things like that. Uh, you look at, you know, places in Africa where they grow sorghum, uh, again, you know, very good at conserving water. Uh, and it all surrounds this idea of C4 photosynthesis. These plants don't need to open their stomates as wide to get the same amount of carbon as a C3 plant will. Right, right, evolution. Um, Addy actually wrote in and had a question for you. Oh, um, right. What is your favorite part of photosynthesis? Oh, capture light, <laughs> without a doubt. The capture of light, that just fascinates me. You know, um, leaf optics, it's really cool. You know, once a photon, oh, once, once a photon gets inside of a leaf, what the heck happens to it? Yeah. You know, bounce around for, you know, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it certainly would make sense. You know, I was told that a photon uh, can bounce around inside of a leaf for over 100 miles Whoa. before it's eventually absorbed, which to me is just crazy. And how but long do you... Not. Yeah, how long do you think that would be in like time? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's like on the matter of femtoseconds. Oh, okay. So it's like <sighs> maybe even lower than that. I don't know. Yeah. So. Okay. Interesting. Um, and if you had unlimited resources, um, what kind of research would you um, want to look into, or have you looked into that research that you're interested in? Oh, if I had unlimited resources, I'd go back and do research in Antarctica. Again, yeah. without thinking twice, I love that place. Um, Why so? You know, I it's it's really is like the last front, one of the last frontiers on this planet. Um, and you know, just in the past, oh God, you know, 25, 30 years, um, you know, Antarctica has seen dramatic changes in its climate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really interesting place to do work, to do science. You know, um, so if I had unlimited resources, I'd go back and. Uh, continue my studies on how uh, the terrestrial ecosystems on the Antarctic Peninsula are responding to climate change. Wow, yeah. I feel like that is like a hot topic that a lot of um, doctors go to, like Antarctica or mm -hmm. places that I, I guess are inhibit inhabitable. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's something that people are just really interested in or it's something that's not as tapped into. I think it's just something that's not as tapped into. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And what advice do you have for people to uh, want to learn more about photosynthesis or get into plant physiology or teaching, I guess? I don't know. Uh, if you want to get into plants, um, you know, there are so many opportunities available, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know how many times I've, you know, lectured to 100 level students. They just say, oh, and I hear this, you know, I've got a 16 year old daughter and she's the same. Well, plants are boring. Oh, no. Like, they're not. They're not. They're I think just, animals are boring. Is that bad? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I agree. Okay. Uh, you heard me. <laughs> animals are just parasites on the plant world, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I think. Once you dive into photosynthesis and actually sit down and think about it, mm -hmm. how incredibly important it is, um, 
it's easy to get really uh, enthusiastic and interested in the subject material. And I know I just went through a bunch of stuff and I probably shouted, you know, said a bunch mm -hmm. of words and people were like, oh God, this is reminding me of high school biology. Yes. Um, but it's really not that hard. Um, and it's really, really cool once yeah. you learn about it. And, and you think about, you know, just how incredibly important, you know, the transfer of solar energy to chemical energy is um, just fundamentally important for function of life on this planet. Yeah, I'll have to probably look at some like diagrams or something to put up yeah. as well for the YouTube channel because I feel like, um, or I should even record something that goes through what a thalicoid membrane is or like what the stroma, the lumen, like the, yeah. the places that you were talking about. I don't think a lot of people are familiar with that even. So you know, I you have to look into that more. Of you could find that, you know, in a, in a basic high school mm -hmm. biology, yeah. you know, uh, textbook. If you're interested, uh, this, I haven't started this book yet, so Ooh. I can't recommend it, but hold on a second. Okay. Uh, I love book recommendations. This was sent to me by a former student who just finished his PhD. Um, it's a book called Eating the Sun, uh, How Plants Power the Planets. And I'm actually going to start this book. I, I am ashamed to say I haven't read it yet, but it has really good reviews and I'm interested and excited to start it. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Because um, I know it's available on Amazon. Okay. So uh, I've heard really good things about it. Nice. Uh, and from what little that I've, I've actually skimmed through it, it looks pretty good. Nice. Well, yeah. Thank you for coming on as uh, I think this will be, yeah, episode eight. And I'm thank you for explaining a little bit of photosynthesis. I know it's a lot for people to um, take. Right. Right. Well, anything else you'd like to well, you know, say? And, or? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, just uh, have you hugged a tree today? Uh, you know, or, yeah, uh, right. I wish. <laughs> Actually, uh, yesterday I did. <laughs> So uh, we can't, uh, you know, we uh, certainly can't dismiss the uh, importance of our, uh, you know, protist friends and uh, bacterial friends, you know, as well as when it comes to photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they're just as important, if not more important in the whole uh, cycle. So awesome. Well, thank you again. Yeah. All right. My pleasure, KK. Have a great day. See ya. Bye. Thanks. Can you tell me like what the difference of C3 and C4 uh, really is again? Sure. So C3 plants is the process we just described. C3 mm -hmm. plants have issues with photorespiration. Uh, C4 plants are plants that have, um, through the process of evolution, uh, evolved a mechanism to cope with this issue of photorespiration by uh, creating a spatial separation between where carbon is brought in and where carbon is actually uh, fixed by rubisco. Um, and it utilizes a, uh, a different enzyme for the initial um, process uh, called PEPC. So PEPC stands for phosphorylenol pyruvate carboxylase. Mm -hmm. And PEPC uh, is going to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and attach it to a three carbon molecule called phosphorylenol pyruvate, PEP, to make a four carbon molecule called uh, malate or aspartate, depending upon the species. Hmm. Um, and the good thing about C4 plants is that PEPC has absolutely no affinity for oxygen. Hmm. And you've heard me say before that, um, you know, just like in the 1980s, the uh, cola, Pepsi Cola, you know, came out and their big advertising slogan was the choice of a new generation. Well, Pepsi, uh, the enzyme is the choice of a new generation of plants, C4 mm. plants, right, that evolved yeah. in response to this issue surrounding uh, photorespiration and reductions in uh, global CO2 concentrations and increases in aridity and things like that. Mm -hmm. So what are some examples of each? Uh, oh, well, you know, C4 plants uh, are typically, you know, very uh, well represented in the grass, grasses, the poaceae. Uh, so things like big blue stem, corn, corn yep. is a C4 plant, right? Sorghum's another one, you know. Uh, there's a reason, you know, 
why we can we do so well at growing corn is because they exhibit C4 photosynthesis, right? They have mm -hmm. some uh, mechanisms in place to deal with uh, water use and water availability and things like that. Uh, you look at you know places in Africa where they grow sorghum. Uh, again, you know, very good at conserving water. Uh, and it all surrounds this idea of C4 photosynthesis. These plants don't need to open their stomates as wide to get the same amount of carbon as a C3 plant will. Right, right, evolution. Um, Addy actually wrote in and had a question for you. Oh, um, all right. What is your favorite part of photosynthesis? Oh, capture light, <laughs> without a doubt. The capture of light, that just fascinates me. You know, um, leaf optics. It's really cool. You know, once a photon, oh, when, once a photon gets inside of a leaf, what the heck happens to it? Yeah. You know, it bounce around for, you know, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it certainly would make sense. You know, I was told that a photon uh, can bounce around inside of a leaf for over 100 miles Whoa. before it's eventually absorbed, which to me is just crazy. And how Maybe long do you... Yeah, how long do you think that would be in like time? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's like on the matter of femtoseconds. Oh, okay. So it's like <laughs> maybe even lower than that. I don't know. Yeah. So. Okay. Interesting. Um, and if you had unlimited resources, um, what kind of research would you um, want to look into, or have you looked into that research that you're interested in? Oh, if I had unlimited resources, I'd go back and do research in Antarctica. Again, yeah. without thinking twice, I love that place. Um, Why so? You know, I it's it's really is like the last front, one of the last frontiers on this planet. Um, and you know, just in the past, oh God, you know, 25, 30 years, um, you know, Antarctica has seen dramatic changes in its climate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really interesting place to do work, to do science. You know, um, so if I had unlimited resources, I'd go back and. Uh, continue my studies on how uh, the terrestrial ecosystems on the Antarctic Peninsula are responding to climate change. Wow, yeah. I feel like that is like a hot topic that a lot of um, doctors go to, like Antarctica or mm -hmm. places that I, I guess are inhibit inhabitable. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's something that people are just really interested in or it's something that's not as tapped into. I think it's just something that's not as tapped into. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And what advice do you have for people to uh, want to learn more about photosynthesis or get into plant physiology or teaching, I guess? I don't know. Uh, if you want to get into plants, um, you know, there are so many opportunities available, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know how many times I've, you know, lectured to 100 level students. They just say, oh, and I hear this, you know, I've got a 16 year old daughter and she's the same. Well, plants are boring. Oh, no. Like, they're not. They're not. They're I think just, animals are boring. Is that bad? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I agree. Okay. Uh, you heard me. <laughs> animals are just parasites on the plant world, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I think. Once you dive into photosynthesis and actually sit down and think about it, mm -hmm. how incredibly important it is, um, it's easy to get really uh, enthusiastic and interested in the subject material. And I know I just went through a bunch of stuff and I probably shouted, you know, said a bunch mm -hmm. of words and people were like, oh God, this is reminding me of high school biology. Yes. Um, but it's really not that hard. Um, and it's really, really cool once yeah. you learn about it. And, and you think about, you know, just how incredibly important, you know, the transfer of solar energy to chemical energy is um, just fundamentally important for function of life on this planet. Yeah, I'll have to probably look at some like diagrams or something to put up yeah. as well for the YouTube channel, because I feel like... Um, or I should even record something that goes through what a thalicoid membrane is or like what the stroma, the lumen, like the, yeah. the places that you were talking about. I don't think a lot of people are familiar with that even. So you I know, might you, have to look into that more. Of, you could find that, you know, in a, in a basic high school mm -hmm. biology, yeah. you know, uh, textbook. If you're interested, uh, this, I haven't started this book yet, so Ooh. I can't recommend it, but hold on a second. Okay. I love book recommendations. Uh, sent to me by a former student who just finished his PhD. Um, it's a book called Eating the Sun. 
uh, How Plants Power the Planets. And I'm actually going to start this book. I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't read it yet, but it has really good reviews and I'm interested and excited to start it. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, I'll put that I'll in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Because um, I know it's available on Amazon. Okay. So, uh, I've heard really good things about it. Nice. Uh, and from what little that I've, I've actually skimmed through it, it looks pretty good. Nice. Well, yeah. Thank you for coming on as a, I think this will be, yeah, episode eight. And I'm, thank you for explaining a little bit of photosynthesis. I know it's a lot for people to um, take, but I think maybe later on I'll also go and simplify some things. So sure. I'll, I'll look at some uh, diagrams and try to understand YouTube a little more. I finally got, you know, the microphone recording a little bit and YouTube is like a whole different, <laughs> different editing system, but it'll be fun. Right. All right. right. Well, anything else you'd like to well, you know, say? And, or? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, just, uh, have you hugged a tree today? Uh, you know, or, yeah, uh, right. I wish <laughs> actually uh, yesterday I did. <laughs> So uh, we can't, uh, you know, we uh, certainly can't dismiss the uh, importance of our, uh, you know, protist friends and uh, bacterial friends, you know, as well as when it comes to photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they're just as important, if not more important in the whole uh, cycle. So awesome. Well, thank you again. Yeah. All right. My pleasure. KK. Have a great day. See ya. Bye. Thanks.